Okay, in session two of our screencast videos, we are looking at uh, what I've called the spiritual oasis. Uh, and really what we're looking at is the desert, ironically. Um, a group of people we refer to as the desert fathers and mothers, and a, um, uh, a, a, a trend in Christian theology, Christian spirituality, called asceticism. Okay, um, this will this will jive very well for those of you who um, are rather experiential in your faith. You enjoy sitting in silent meditation and spending extended time uh, with God in personal, private devotion or a kind of uh, sacred space. Uh, th this is probably going to sit well with with quite a few of you. For others of us. Uh, this is going to sound a little odd and perhaps even a little bit uncomfortable. So keep that in mind as we go and remember that they, they are still trying to do something uh, theologically here that, um, that, that we're going to find some connection with in, uh, in some of our philosophy. So let's, uh, let's dive into the oasis, the, the desert. Um, early on in church history, we have a shift where... The, um, some of our leading spiritual individuals begin moving out and away towards some kind of seclusion. Uh, we, we called them the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Uh, I refer to them here on the slide as Desert Dwellers. Um, there's, uh, there's a handful of them that we're going to talk about here. Uh, Abba Moses is the first. And uh, he, he believed that this shift out to the desert... Uh, the seclusion and um, this sort of uh, isolationist uh, stance was uh, a spiritual practice or connected to spiritual practices or both where the goal is to free the heart from any kind of injury that could be caused to it by bodily passions and then keep it free. Um, without the purity of heart, he argued, nobody can enter the kingdom of heaven. And so... Relying on the Beatitudes and the teaching of Jesus there about the pure in heart will see God, Abba Moses um, is looking for these keys to finding this purity of heart where we as Christians are not contaminated by these worldly, fleshly, what he calls bodily passions. Um, some of you here at the school are, are, are familiar with Mrs. Pitts and, and her, uh, these three things uh, cause us to sin, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Similarly, Abba Moses sort of understood things to be the same way. If we can rid ourselves from these bodily passions, these corruptions that infiltrate the heart and keep us from finding this kind of purity, then we can make progress toward what's promised us in the Beatitudes, which is the pure in heart will see God. Here, Abba Moses sounds a little bit like uh, our Stoic Roman philosophers. While he's advocating this spiritual practice uh, from a, a little bit of a different standpoint than our Stoic philosophers, the method sounds awfully similar, if you'll, if you'll remember correctly. So first... Um, our Stoic friends are advocating that total freedom is found in the dominance of the will and the suppression of desire. Now, they're not advocating sort of, um, remember that they're not advocating self-injury. They're not advocating uh, anything that would be harmful necessarily. What they are advocating, though, is the... The submission of passion and desire to the human will, and that the human will should be the driving force of our lives. In Stoic thought, then, these passions and desires get in the way of the will being able to sort out right and wrong and then cause action according to that will. And so this purity of will. But Moses sounds pretty similar to that when he talks about the purity of heart. Now, 
The difference there is that he's, he's not advocating this just dominance of the human will in bringing the rest of ourself in subjection to this is my will, this is what is right, this is what ought to be done. Instead, what he's primarily advocating is a purity of heart that is aimed at God in devotion to him and his holiness, his righteous standard. And what he's really looking for here is a kind of participation. And really, this is going to be characteristic of all of our desert dwellers. He's looking for a participation. He, he wants to bring those bodily passions and desires that get in the way of righteousness and purity and holiness. He wants to bring those in subjection to the heart, the will, the life that Christ calls us to. And so we aim at this purity of heart, not as a matter of self-perfection, but as a, as a way of participating in the sanctification and the work of God to make us and participate in what God is making us, to make us what God is calling us to be. The, the people that are right with him in the way that they live their life. And so his goal here is a kind of holiness, Okay? And, he, and he's advocating the practice then, like a lot of our other aesthetics, of removing ourselves from society out into the desert to engage in spiritual disciplines in order to find the purity of heart that sets us free from our worldly passions and desires that get in the way of the kind of people we're supposed to be in order to be with God. We do want to deny some of the world around us to find solitude, holiness, and purity, instead of our worldly passions and devices. But that's in partnership with God in a kind of intimacy with him that sets us free from evil and corruption. The, the overlap here with Stoic philosophy is this idea that we, we may not be able to fully trust those passions and desires and urges. And so there should be something in us, the will primarily, that is bringing these things in subjection. The difference between stoic subjection of, of the desires and the passions of, uh, of our lives, of our flesh, of our bodies, and Abba Moses will bringing these things in subjection is the end goal. In Stoic philosophy, it is sort of a, a self um, a self denial for self perfection, according to these uh, philosophical beliefs. For Abba Moses, it is a partnership with God, wherein I'm at work with God's Holy Spirit working in me to to purge out those things in my life that are injurious, uh, injurious to me, that cause me harm, and that keep me from living the life that I'm supposed to live in Christ, both this idea of holiness and this idea of genuine Christian freedom in the holiness and righteousness of God. For Abba Moses, we get to participate in God's work in making us those individuals. Okay, And so we are going to deny a little bit of ourselves on the flip side, one of the, the strongest commonalities that our aesthetic individuals and Abba Moses right, is going to have with some of the philosophy that we've heard in the past is with our Mesopotamian friends. Remember from the Treasures of Darkness, this numinous encounter with the divine. In going out and engaging in the spiritual disciplines, Abba Moses and these others like him are encouraging this numinous encounter, the divine and the human meeting in these powerful conflict exchanges where we are refined by, we are shaped by the encounter of the divine. And along the way, for our, our desert fathers and our desert mothers, we become like what God intends us to be when we come in contact with him through the spiritual disciplines. Solitude, 
silent reflection, contemplation, meditation on the Word of God, prayer, and fasting. And so some of these self-denial practices are not just self-denial for the purpose of being self-denial. They are ways that we engage the power of God at work in our lives to be making us, as we participate in it, making us into the people that God is calling us to be. Okay, and so this is Abba Moses. We want to free the heart from those things that get in the way of the holiness and the righteousness and the kind of people that we are supposed to be. We're supposed to find our purity of heart, primarily because the pure in heart will see God. So, if we're not pure in heart, we won't get to see God. This is the flip side of it. And so Abba Moses stresses for us the purity of heart. Syncletisa, I believe is how you say that name, uh, is an aesthetic. Uh, and believed that these aesthetic practices uh, were the means by which we became shaped into what God wants for us. Very much like Abba Moses. It's a little bit broader now. He doesn't zone it in quite as much, uh, or it's not zoned in here quite as much as Abba Moses was with his purity of heart. But it is an, it, it is a, there, there's a stress here in this, uh, in this school of thought that um, the denial of the world around us, the seeking of solitude, uh, of holiness, instead of our own purity, or, or, sorry, our own worldly passions and desires, through the practice of the spiritual discipline, is how we participate in the sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And so, our engagement with God in the spiritual disciplines and practices is actual engagement with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us that brings us to a place of being before God where God can be at work in us, to be shaping us into what He wants for us, Sometimes that's what he wants for us in purpose. Sometimes it's a lot like Abba Moses, what he wants for us in the kind of individuals that we are supposed to be. We add to this, this, this or we, we add here a bit, of a, uh, a, a bit of a new thought, this contemplation uh, and the role of contemplation. You all have participated with me in the practice of Lectio Divina. Uh, one of those steps is this contemplative, reflective kind of thought. And so here, we get introduced to this idea of contemplation as a means of bringing us into the awareness of the things we cannot explain about God to encounter them, again, numinous power here, to encounter them in such a way that while we cannot express the truth that is there, we can experience the truth that is there. And that encounter with God is what is formative for us. Okay? So, Abba Moses and our Syncletisa, Syncletisa, I think, okay, uh, are advocating these practices as the means by which we participate in God's work in refining, sanctifying, and making us into what He desires for us to be. Okay. Our next two thoughts begin to take a step um, that some in the early church believed was a step too far. Um, a lot of our early church thinkers believed, uh, and, and the Catholic Church still stresses this quite a, stresses this quite a bit, um, we get to participate in the life of God. We get to participate in the divinity um, by our engagement in the church and the sacraments and the spiritual disciplines. Now that participation doesn't necessarily make us divine. It's, it's a grace in an interaction with God that acknowledges the spirit dwelling and being at work within us. Our next two thoughts here from our desert dwellers, uh, the Cappadocians, and um, Macrina um, are going to take that a little bit further. And to be totally honest with you, it's a little bit further than I am comfortable with. So the Cappadocians is where we're going to start. This idea of theosis. Uh, Jesus Christ became man that we might become God. Takes a step beyond just the participation in the divine and, and is a reworking of what we are. 
to becoming divine. And in this way, uh, this numinous experience, remember they are desert dwellers, they're still focusing on these aesthetic Christian practices, okay? Um, these spiritual disciplines and these aesthetic practices, these engagements in the numinous, the, 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 the confrontations we get as human beings with the divine, bring us to a place where we begin to become like they are, like Christ is, like God is. And for me, that's one step too far. Uh, I think there's a really, uh, a very real sense in which we participate in the work of God. But I have a hard time with the we become divine or God-like or um, beyond sort of the image of God in creation, Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Here, though, there, there is a real connection back to individuals like Plato and Socrates, who are advocating that those elements of the human soul that were divine, uh, Plato's myth of the metals, remember, what makes us who and what we are, uh, comes to us as part of the divine, alive in the soul within the human being. This is similar to what the Cappadocians are, uh, are, are sort of attaching themselves to. Th this spark, this essence of divinity that exists within us, Jesus Christ became man and became incarnate, that we might sort of transcend the boundaries of our humanity to become like him in that divinity. Okay? Now, this is, um, this is that numinous encounter coupled with the, the idea of the soul as the divine element of the human person from our Greek philosophers, and so we're sort of stacking a couple of things together here, that gets expressed through practices that look like Roman, Roman Stoicism uh, in, in sort of Christianized context. Okay? And so Jesus became human, that humanity might become divine. And like I said, I've, I've got a little bit of a problem with that. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to talk about participation in the work and the ministry maybe even some participation in the life of God, um, that even still, I got to sort out a little bit of what they mean when they say that um, and, what they, and what, quite what they mean by that to be totally comfortable with it. But the Cappadocians for me go one step too far, okay? Uh, Macrina, hopefully I'm saying these names correctly, um, the soul is godlike when it is separated from all emotion. Uh, this is a further step toward our Roman Stoic friends. Um, and the emphasis here on the soul, it, we, we should hear echoing in our ears Plato and Socrates, really, uh, in, our, in our Greek classics, okay? Um, this thought goes even deeper into that, that step of Roman Stoicism. We practice the spiritual disciplines as a way of stripping all other things away from the soul, as a way of divorcing ourselves from the world around us and the corruption that we see and experience in our human lives and stepping out of that corruption and emotion into this kind of pure spiritual state. Now, it... it it's, it's flavored with Christianity here, but to me it sounds a, a, a lot like Roman Stoicism. Stripping away all of these other things, this practice of self-denial to the point of pure reason and will, it's spiritualized here in the Christian context. But it's a way of stripping out and pulling away all of those other things so that what is left for us is sort of this pure soul encountering God and becoming like God as we, as, we, as we remove that emotive, that affective quality of what it is to be human. And we strip that away and we focus on will, we focus on sort of a pure spirituality, which... Uh, isn't tainted by our human emotion. Okay, so at this point, we've we've got our um, our desert friends who, in practice, um, sound a little bit like our Stoics. Sort of all of them across the board. So.
some of them uh, sound like those Stoics in a, in a pretty strongly Christianized uh, manner. That's a little bit comfortable for us or more comfortable for us. This means of engaging in spiritual disciplines that refines us and is participation in the work of God's sanctification to make us the people that he is calling us to be. Uh, our last two uh, really take it a step too far for me. Th- this full participation in, the, in divinity. Um, is, is just is, is one step too far. And they go a bit further into that stoic realm. The more we strip away from our humanity, the more we experience the, the pure soul and the divinity and God-likeness of that pure soul. Um, that, that for me is too dualistic with the human person. Okay? Um, and we'll talk more about that in class, but this is kind of the basics of our dwe- desert dwellers and our aestheticism. Okay, so um, so here's where we leave. All right, we'll pick up with some of the ideas here in class and have some and have some discussion. Uh, but at this point, we've reached uh, a good stopping point.